Um, okay, so hello everyone and uh, welcome to today's lecture um, as part of the conversation um, on Venice lecture series uh, this term. Um, so the series brings together architects, educators, curators and community organizers who are involved in the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale. In each session, we invited a selection of National Pavilion and Biennale contributors, most of whom have connection to the AAIM, uh, and to discuss common themes that spans across their installation in Venice and beyond, to address issue of care, mutuality, context, um, collaboration, and above all, togetherness. So the title of this year Biennale, for the ones who maybe are not familiar with it, is how we will live together, and it was curated and was selected by Yashim Serkis. Um, it was probably a rather prophetic title since the show was originally scheduled uh, to open in May 2020 and was later postponed uh, by a year to 2021, as we all know, the result of COVID-19 pandemic. And as a consequence, all participants had an additional year to reflect, and not just on their contribution, but on the whole role of architecture at large in a time of crisis. So um, my name is Francesca Romana Dell'Aglio and I'm a tutor here at DAA and I have been personally involved as a participant and assistant curator to some of the Biennale uh, from 2018. I've written reviews around the Biennale and I taught recently a summer school unit together with Rory Sherlock that tries to bridge a conversation between academia and the institution of the Biennale in Venice. Today's particular conversation revolves around, around the theme of mutual support, uh, which tries to unveil the existence of network of mutual support, not just as a novelty of the COVID-19 pandemic, but as an aptitude that resides in an architecture of mutuality and care that is typically created as a way to collaborative build resilience during times of, of adversity. So today, uh, curators uh, of the Philippines and the British Pavilion discuss how their installation involved to place value on collective care through an architecture that engages in participation and collective agency. So to represent the Philippine Pavilion, we have Alex Furness and Sudar Kadka, who both run a shared architecture practice framework collaborative rooted in principle of collaboration and mutual support as a collaborative project that invests in the process of building structures and spaces that will strengthen social relationship, reciprocity and cohesion. And instead, to represent the British Pavilion with Madeleine Kessler and Manija Verghese, both co-founder of Unseen Architecture, which is a platform for design, research, curation that work with local community across disciplines and scales and help them in finding and strengthening their agency over how they use and occupy their spaces. You can read, of course, longer bios for each of our guests today in, on the AA website. But before I hand over um, to Alex and Sudar to begin the conversation, I would just make a few technical notes about the, the kind of format. So we will have two um, short presentation from our curators uh, and then we can start the conversation. I can kick off the conversation by asking a few questions, but of course you are invited to, to ask how many questions you, you like. Uh, and it's a sort of very informal type of conversation. And you can you feel free to use either the raise and options or you just write the, the question in the chat and I can read it for you. Um, often actually the, the, the speakers really can, can read themselves the question and respond automatically. Uh, but so, and now on another really final note, in if you feel comfortable to do so, of course, just please turn on your camera, especially during the discussion, just is a kind of um, way to feel all that we are all part of, a, we are all in the same room, we're all part of the same space, um, despite, of course, this series is entirely held online. Um, so without further ado, I, I will, uh, let's start the presentation and thank you for, for being with us. Mm. Great, thank you so much for having us. I mean, we're really thank happy you. to be here. <laughs> I wish we could be there physically, but it's nice to us to be there digitally. Um, so we'll start off then, yeah? Okay, okay so the Philippine Pavilion uh, is called uh, Structures of Mutual Support, and it's looking into traditions of mutual support that we have around the world. It's practices that are very much embedded in different cultures and traditions. Um, so now we've been exploring this for about 12 years, but uh, the pavilion has been kind of a way for us to, to bring it all together. 
Uh, where I come from in Norway, we call this tradition uh, dugnad, and it's been a way for uh, community here to deal with harvest, farming, construction. You see a little photo here on the side. In the Philippines, it's called bayanihan. And very often this is used, uh, you know, to deal with uh, disasters, uh, but also in every day. Uh, this example here is moving a house from one place to the other. So for Sudan and I, we're very interested in how these traditions create a platform for how we can create space that belongs to the people that we work with, but it's also rooted in the values of solidarity, care, empathy, these principles that are the foundations of these traditions. But um, at the kind of to describe the pavilion, you, there is this idea which is very important to us, which is to look at architecture as a process rather than as an object. And this process that we're specifically looking at is mutual support, which offers then uh, kind of a different um, starting point to talk about the values that then creates the built environment that's important for us. Um, we run processes that are structured around six steps, uh, learning, questioning, making, concept, design, and build. And the point with this process is to articulate a situa situation together with the community that we work with, then question it, and then make something to suggest how we can transform that situation into something that we want it to be in the future. This then creates a concept that then guides our design and build process. The idea is then that the architecture becomes something of a... Uh, uh, a manifestation of the society that we want to live in or the way that we want to live together rather than just kind of a passive representation of the way and uh, the inequalities and struggles that are shaping our lives. The project is a collaboration with a small community in Angat, Philippines. Uh, we teamed up with them and proposed to the commissioners that we would do this project and then they chose us to do the Philippine Pavilion. And the idea was that we'd run through these six steps with the community and create something that we didn't know at the outset what it was. So we started the process of learning about the current situation with the community. Um, we do different activities, we draw, we map, we act, we do full-scale prototypes. Um, but in this case, in the specific uh, phase that we were working with at the moment, we were looking at what is the situation of the village right now and how can we work together? So we're exploring the concept of Bayanihan, but also the kind of the built structures of the village and the challenges that we kind of identify in that. Now, what's important is the way that we work together, it also enables us to find gaps or differences or um, similarities in the groups that we work with. I think there is this assumption that everyone has a shared understanding about the place, but very often uh, people will always have a different perspective of their situation. So to work together, we can actually bring this out um, this example here, you see the red line drawings, that's the kids kind of mapping out all the spaces their parents didn't actually add to this, the map of the village. So there's a different perspective that needs to be discussed. We then question the challenges uh, and, and kind of issues that we identify, but also the possibilities that are there in the village. Um, in this example here, the community that we worked with, they identified um, kind of a series of problems that they wanted to address. These kind of problem trees are examples of um, the, how the root causes of a problem leads and branches out and affects the community. It's kind of a very common method. But uh, we also do acting. <laughs> and, and this is a really nice example. Antonio, which is uh, normally quite a quiet guy, he's here becoming a typhoon, um, full energy blowing down the whole village. But what this acting does, it, it allows us to talk about a moment or a situation in the village where people act and react to, us, to something. Uh, and that creates a space to discuss, you know, is this the way that we want the place to be or is this how we want it to, um, yeah, transform in the future. Um, the things that we make, we always try to discuss them collectively. So the community, we, we get together and we, we make things and we lay them out and we compare them. And that's a kind of a way to... Uh, look at how we, uh, for one, have different perspectives, but two, also come have something in common, right? Um, what, what was interesting in this process was that when we were trying to identify the project, the kind of uh, very dense living conditions that they have, um, they created a need for a space where they could have their own quarrels. Uh, so it, a conflict resolution space, a place where they could step out and, and have a proper fight, you know, if they needed to. Because at the moment, everything is so dense that if you have a discussion, everyone will know about it. 
At the same time, there was also discussion about the space for education. So this is kind of what these two steps are doing. They're identifying these uh, challenges or possibilities to do something and improve the way that we live together. But then also uh, in the act of talking and reflecting and learning about the place, we also try to make things so we can actually look at how we can transform the situation that we're in. Uh, this is a, 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 an example. It's a, it's a, what do you call it? Scoreboard, a little structure next to the basketball court that was built to kind of look at, um, you know, for one, uh, Mom Mayor, for example, being one of the community members, which was really into construction. How could he run a construction site? Uh, you know, with the, the skills and knowledge that he has and his team, uh, but also to look at how these structures that we make, how they're maintained and used over time. So this little sample thing that we built in a week, it became a, a birthday gathering, like a place for birthdays, a restaurant, <laughs> you know, event space. So it became all these different things next to the basketball court, in addition to a scoreboard. So, you know, this act of making and trying and testing, it reveals also how you use the buildings that you create and stuff. Yeah. So there. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, after the first three steps, we really focus on trying to understand the situation and trying to contextualize ourselves and the community within the context of the what they want to build and the village itself. We then started to begin creating like a common language by which we could discuss, you know, architectural ideas. But what's really important to us is like when you're really working on a collaborative project, I think it's really critical to, to begin talking in the same language kind of having your own vernacular having a way to speak to each other that everyone understands so those three first three steps are really critical in, in creating that and so um after creating that i think what emerged from the process is that uh, this concept of maaliwalas the idea of maaliwalas is a filipino concept of space it's used to describe spaces which are bright open airy well ventilated light peaceful sort of like all these good qualities are embodied by that word and uh, when we were talking with the community, they were always bringing up, you know, when we were asking, what kind of spaces do you imagine or do you like to have? They will always say it has to be Maliwalas, it has to be, you know, these, these things. And, and so we dug deeper into the concept and what we realized is that it's, it's a concept which allowed us to structure everything uh, in the design coming from, you know, how we talk about the plants, how we talk about the building section, how we talk about the roof, how the roof relates to the sunlight, to the wind, how it relates to scale does the space become too big um, because because of the the height that they want it's also about how you raise the building off the ground so that the wind passes through so this concept of maliwala encompassed almost everything about design so at the same time we also introduced this idea of the grid which we are all familiar with so i think the idea of using a modular grid allowed us to um, give a quantity to the spaces that we were discussing and at the same time it relates to the construction of how you can create something in a modular way, how something is expandable in that sense as well. So these, uh, this concept of the Maliwalas and the concept of the grid became the common language by which we were able to communicate with each other quite easily, uh, architectural thoughts and their thoughts about what they would like to do. Yes. So uh, in terms of the design, again, taking off from that concept of Maliwalas, we even used it to design the windows and the doors around the building. So we went uh, mapping, went around the community trying to map out different windows or different doors that they found get, captured this feeling of Ba'aliwalas. And so we mapped them, drew them up, and also actually kind of made our own interpretations of um, these windows and doors in, in bamboo. As you can see, they're, they're mocking up different versions of it. And that became like the final um, design for the facade of the, the doors and windows of the building that we created. Um, at the same time, we also use the idea of the grid to translate the drawings into the physical scale on site. So this idea of the grid, it's kind of a simplified version of, of course, the you know the numerical grid that we would normally use. And we translated that onto the site and it allowed them to capture the sense of scale much more accurately so that the drawings and the site uh, are linked by this. Next. Yeah, so um, after we finalized the design and settled uh, it substantially, so we decided to uh, move on to the building phase where we obviously uh, work with the community themselves. So some members of this uh, work team that we were uh, construct constructing it with come from the community or the villages nearby. So everything was sourced uh, within the supplies that we had within the context. So everything was sourced from the workshop that we had within the village, from the suppliers that we had, like within a few, within an hour's drive away. 
And uh, it was also built with all the workers that we had from the site. So what's important is about this is that I think the neighborhood really was able to come together to kind of build something uh, together using the materials and resources that they had on site. And uh, in, a, in a way, they described this as a form of buy-in hand where they were all pulling together and trying to create something together because uh, at the same time, it adds to the story of how it was built. So the idea of Bayanihan became something that was meaningful to them. And it's something that they have a clear story to narrate their experience with. As, as one person said, you know, that if, if the library were to burn down in the future, the stories of how they created this process really would remain with them over time. Next. So after we built it on site, we took it down and then shipped it to Venice and uh, to be exhibited as part of the Biennale. And after the exhibition, of course, it will be uh, taken down again and shipped back to the community to be reinstalled as part of the village permanently. I think it's important that we are able to see the design in, in both contexts, the context of the Biennale and the context of the site itself. What's interesting is also at the beginning of this project, when we were collaborating with the community, they were fully aware that this building will be transported to, to the Biennale itself, and it will be something that will be exhibited as a representation of the Philippine Pavilion. So in a way, they also understood that it is something, a point of pride, that they designed something that, you know, that will capture their, their, their identity and their needs, as well as sort of represent the country. In, in a way that's uh, meaningful to them as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, another interesting thing was we had to, of course, negotiate the difference between the builders that we had in the Philippines and then the builders that would be building the structure in Venice itself. So it was a different set of constraints that we had, but at the end of the day, we were able to, again, create a different uh, form of communication with them to be able to create this pavilion together. Um, at the end of the day, this is the structure as it sits in the arsenal at the moment. You can see there the windows and the cross bracing is designed through the result of the process that we made with them. Yes. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I was, so, yeah, go ahead. Go for it. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, no, yeah, but also the, you know, so every element that's interesting when you work with the community is this question of how do you, how does each element of the building become Malevalas, right? You're talking about Sudar, like, yeah, yeah. So that there is this negotiation about the built space that we have and how we create something that is the, based on the values that, that we determine as a collective, you know. But yeah, sorry, you should describe the insights, you know. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, I mean, as in, inside the exhibition also, we used, we kind of consider the library as a, as an active space, as a living space. So inside the exhibition, there is a, a portion of it, which is, um, which we, is it's a wall that we use to gather more stories of mutual support. So there's a QR code that people can submit their stories of mutual support from around the world. So, so in a way that becomes like the, an active archive of, of different stories of mutual support and it's serves as a indication of potential things that we could learn from as well. So we really believe that, you know, you know, when we want to answer the question of how we live together, these traditions of mutual support are really ways of living and working together that already exist. And it's, it's like, it's, a, it's so much, uh, there's so much there that we could learn from. And there's so much there that could help us inform the architectural practice as well. Mm. So Thanks. the building, I mean, it's surrounded by also a lot of research and discussion about how we work together. You know, what are these forms mm -hmm. of support, not only in the Philippines, but also other countries? Uh, also bringing in some of the other communities we work with in Brazil, Norway, Vietnam, and also previously in Philippines to talk about what these forms of mutual support are in this context. Um, I mean, it's interesting, I think, to talk also later because it relates to kind of what kind of public space we create, you know, public or private, uh, you know, in terms of these organizations that are forms of meeting and, and creating space. You know, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I think that's it, no? Yeah. Do we have one more? Yep. Yep. That's the full review of the project. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that was great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It was absolutely fascinating um, to hear you talk about. Um, we've also got a few slides. Um, I'll just share my screen. But yeah, really looking forward to delving into the conversation together. Yeah, there's so much um, we have in common, I guess, in two very different pavilions. But also, I think Maddie and I've always wanted to have Alex and Suda give us a tour of the pavilion. And in Venice, we were too busy 
kind of going to events and things like that for, for us to ever be in the same place at the same time. So it's great that we finally got this tour on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, just to quickly go through our, our pavilion. Um, so our pavilion is called the Garden of Privatized Delights. And it's really looking at the topic of privatized public space and how architects can work with the public and various other stakeholders to look at how public space or privatized public space can be opened up for um, different groups to access, use and enjoy. Um, so the whole pavilion takes inspiration from this painting by Hieronymus Bosch. Um, and Maddie and I were really inspired by the kind of triptych format of the painting and how um, this kind of middle ground of earth, which is the subject of the painting, is framed between the two extremes of the utopia of the heavens or Garden of Eden on the left, and then the dystopia of um, hell on the right. And so, um, Maddie, do you want to watch the next slide? Um, to start our kind of concept um, or to like when we were entering the, the open call from the British Council, we uninhabited the painting, which revealed like both the tradition of the English landscape, but also um, kind of how devoid of life uh, public space can be when you take away all traces of kind of, you know, life and inhabitation. And so we then re-inhabited the painting um, into our kind of version, the Garden of Privatized Delights. And here, the three panels of the triptych we translated into, um, on the left, the kind of utopia of um, the commons before the Enclosures Act of the 18th century. Um, on the right, the dystopia of total privatization as a kind of future we may be heading towards. And then in the middle ground, we really wanted to talk about privatized public space as a really important opportunity for um, us to rethink maybe how all the different types of privatized public space could be treated in unique ways in order to open them up for the public to, to kind of use in um, and for more diverse groups actually to have access to them um, and to think about how they can be cross-programmed and revitalized in different ways. Um, and so I suppose this topic of privatised public space, um, it came out of sort of a number of years of research we've done together and particularly this summer school we taught together at the AA, uh, which was all about the pub. And we were really interested in how the pub was sort of this positive example of privatised public space um, that's often overlooked because it's an interior. Um, and we were looking at how we could start to reinvent it and rethink it for the 21st century. Um, I suppose... We were quite interested in how often people think about privatised public space as just this very new phenomenon in um, sort of new developments. And we were quite interested in how it sort of goes back for sort of centuries within British culture um, and our psyche. And so this sort of binary um, way of understanding privatised public space or public good, private bad, um, we were really interested in how we could sort of delve into that middle ground um, and how we sort of get away from this nostalgic way of thinking about a time when the public sector had loads of money, you know, right now they don't. And so how do we therefore navigate this kind of public private world? Um, and this book by Brett Christopher is called The New Enclosure. It sort of looks at the fire sale of public land by the British government over the last decades, uh, which has been happening without public knowledge. Um, and so we're really interested in how sort of a lot of the public spaces we're using are actually privately owned. And there are these sort of this amazing mapping project um, by Anna Powell Smith and Guy Shrubsole called Who Owns England? And you can, if you just Google Who Owns England, there's like a website where you can sort of delve into this map and, and learn more. Um, but essentially all the red areas um, um, on the map sort of show, um, essentially they're, they're documenting um, sort of what, what is actually known in terms of of land ownership so um, there's sort of this real lack of transparency when it comes to land ownership in the UK because it's only document it's only been compulsory to document it on the land registry for sort of the past few decades so if a piece of land hasn't been sold recently um, it's not compulsory for it to be registered on the land registry so there's whole areas of the country which are privately owned but it's very hard to understand who actually owns that land um, which, you know, is really problematic if, you know, there's a piece of land or something on your street and you're wondering how you could start to do something with it for the community, but you don't even know who to have that first conversation with. Um, and Anna and Guy, through their project, they've sort of found that there's over five million acres of land within England and Wales that's still undocumented and not attributed to a particular owner. And so as you enter the Garden of Privatised Delights, um, our pavilion in Venice, you're sort of entering into that middle grounds. Um, you're entering into the middle 
ground of triptych, this weird kind of private public world that we're all living in. And you're immediately confronted by these railings and you can see there's something going on behind, but you can't actually enter it. You're sort of forced to continue your journey through the whole pavilion until you find yourself back inside the garden square. And so that's really setting up the issue of privatised public space that, you know, often it's inaccessible or you, and, you know, you have to have a key or, you know, be from a certain group or part of society in order to access that space. And so what we're really looking at is how can we open up these privatised public spaces to make them more inclusive, uh, to make them more sort of locally specific and give people and local communities ownership over their public space. So you're immediately ushered on um, into the pub um, and each of the rooms have been designed by different room designers. So the pub's been designed by the decorators. Um, and this room's really looking at sort of how can we reinvent the pub um, for the 21st century? And it sort of asks, each room asks, a, a sort of key question within that space and this room is asking whether the pub can be a place that's more than just a place for drinking and become a versatile centre for civic action and so the main bar structure it sort of changes in height to allow anyone to sit around a table and there are these pieces of infrastructure embedded in it like the post box letter box uh, plug sockets and other things to sort of allow it to be used by the community in different ways and then you also see these kind of fragments um, of familiar pubs um, on the walls so for example, these two framed uh, pub carpets. So every single Weatherspoons pub, um, hopefully you guys are probably familiar with the Weatherspoons, they're like the largest pub chain in the UK, but weirdly kind of make quite an effort to make each pub feel locally specific. So with the name of the pub, but also every single pub has a different carpet. Um, and so just kind of looking and analysing what are the elements that actually make a pub um, a pub. And so from there, you move into the Ministry of Collective Data, which was designed by a practice called Built Works. And here it's really looking at um, how um, our data is kind of captured in the city. There's like CCTVs, there's all the devices we have in our pockets. There's tons of ways we're tracked and um, documented in the city. And so um, this room is really asking kind of would that change if this data was collectively owned and we um, better understood kind of I guess the systems that kind of control our data and how it's owned. So when you enter, there's a question on the screen that um, right in front of you that tells you that if you consent to your data being captured, you should walk right. And if not, you walk left and you proceed as a kind of undocumented shadow. But if you walk right, your image gets captured and translated into an avatar that then follows you around the room and tells you kind of, um, the benefit of like having your data captured as part of this collective database and then that totem in the center kind of um, reveals like data that has been captured about you and what that says about you but then also the benefits of this database and it also gives you more information on current um, debate around facial recognition technology and so um, and then there's these like large like tree trunks in the space that kind of continue the garden theme. And those are also meant as like kind of devices where you can camouflage yourself behind if you want to resist being captured. But the room itself is really trying to look at the power structures that are kind of embedded in um, privatized public space in terms of the lack of transparency around who owns our data, but also that uh, going back to this idea of a binary that nothing is really good or bad, that um, I think we're suspicious of facial recognition technology, but it's not necessarily bad. There's like a great case study of like how it's been used to locate like tons of lost children in India. Um, and it's it actually can have positive benefits. It's just maybe in the wrong hands, it can be used like uh, to, to a disadvantage. So um, it's trying to provoke a question. And so I think for us in the pavilion, it was really important that there were existing spaces that you recognize from British towns and cities, but then there were also proposed spaces. So we have two government ministries, and this is the first one as a way to kind of propose a more bottom-up approach to the ownership of data. Yeah, I suppose I think we're really interested in the different scales that the architect can work at um, in order to sort of open up our cities and allow greater sort of participation and access to privatised public space, which is why I think our pavilion is sort of has quite sort of tactile design interventions, but at the same time, we're looking at policy and legislation through those rooms that Manager mentions. And so from the ministry, you sort of enter into the high streets. Um, and this has been designed by Studio Polpo, who are a social enterprise practice based in Sheffield. Um, and this room is sort of asking whether high streets can go beyond commercial interests and become diverse places of social exchange. Um, and so as you enter this room, there's an ATM 
um, which is just off the corner of this photo. But the ATM, instead of dispensing money, it dispenses advice. Um, and that advice comes out of the receipt dispenser at, at the end of this installation. Um, but the installation essentially is looking at these different kind of forms of social exchange on the high street. So list and sharing and acting. And so, for example, when you go and get your haircuts, you're not just paying for a haircut, but you're also getting a conversation with someone, which can be really, really important, like especially you know, for an elderly person, you might not see anyone else that day. And so these cones above, they play these soundscapes from Sheffield High Streets. Um, and then the central kind of table, this is looking at sharing and it plays a soundscape from Sheffield Food Hall, uh, which is a sort of pay as you feel project. And so the food hall, it takes waste uh, kind of vegetables and food uh, from surrounding cafes and supermarkets that would otherwise be thrown out in them. They make really amazing meals with it. And then anyone could come for a meal there and you just pay whatever you can afford. And then throughout the day, the space, it sort of transforms into different activities from like yoga classes to like uh, dance classes to a uh, place just for people to hang out and this kind of this this boundary between volunteer and participant is really blurred um, and that's sort of then going into the area of act where you know you sort of take your piece of advice from this receipt dispenser um, and you start to look at the kind of different ways that you can actually act within your community um, to sort of have that sort of social and mutual care and responsibility over one another. So then from there, you get into the second ministry, which is the Ministry of Common Land. And um, if the previous one was looking at how we can collectively own our data, this is really looking at how we can common, like how we can like really look at the issue of common land. And so this mound in the center is um, uh, like designed as a kind of citizens assembly and looking at how citizens can take decisions around land. So as Maddie mentioned previously, you know, so much of public land is being sold off without the public's knowledge. And so creating a space where people can actually take decisions about land that's meant to be publicly owned was really important. And um, Public Works, who designed this room, um, have like a, a huge history of kind of working uh, with gap sites in the city and working with local communities. And so on the right hand side, you can see a banner that they designed in the history of kind of trade union and protest banners um, to explore the themes of the ministry. But then on the far wall behind, there's a situated image, which is a really big part of their practice, looking at how do we document, um, like, I guess what gets discussed in community meetings, which often like maybe looks like people sitting around drinking cups of tea, but actually there's lots of really important ideas being discussed. So um, in, in this image, they actually, it was like one of the best days in the project. It was right when the lockdown was easing kind of in, I think early April or late March. And um, it was, they got all these people who'd been working on this project in Loughborough Junction in South London um, over a 10 year period to come at different hours. And they kind of did this big photo shoot and made this Composite image and Maddie and I got to be part of it, so you can like find us in the image. But um, it's uh, it was really amazing as a way they had made all these props, um, including these large large paper mache heads, which you can see some of them installed in the in the room, um, which were made by school children in Stratford. And they're meant to, do, to, to represent the different kind of figures that are really influential in the discussion around co common land. So from Jane Jacobs to Colin Ward to various others. And so they had everyone from like children who had shaped an adventure playground to people who had helped build the kind of community kitchen and community gardens on site. And they all kind of came together to stage this massive image. And it was like a really incredible feat. But the actual design of the space is really looking at the hierarchy of the minister's office typically and like how that's like usually a desk that the minister sits behind and how do we kind of break that power structure by bringing everyone around one table to have a discussion. And then from the Ministry of Common Land, you enter into Play Without Grounds. Um, and this is an installation that's been designed by, by VPPR. And it's really looking at places in the city for young people and teenagers. And so often in the city, you have places that are for very active teenagers. Um, but a lot of teenagers, a lot of female teenagers, but also teenagers in general, they just want to sit around with their mates. And as soon as they do that, they're just sort of ushered on. Um, and so it's looking at how can we create sort of frameworks and spaces in the city for teenagers to hang out in and just sort of belong and take over on their own terms. Um, and so how do we sort of design with teenagers rather than for them? And so this spherical structure, it's been inspired by the forms of the painting, um, which I think all the structures in the pavilion actually have. Um, we sort of took that painting as sort of a sounding board for people to reference in terms of the colours and the shapes. Um, 
And then around the structure, there are these speakers that play these conversations with young people from around the UK about the kinds of spaces they would like to see in their city um, and how they feel in their cities, like whether they feel sort of welcome um, or, you know, the spaces that they they would like to, to feel welcome in. So finally, having been through the whole pavilion, you find yourself back in the Garden of Delight, except this time on the inside of the railings. And this room is really where everything comes together. And it's designed as a space where you can sit and like reflect on the kind of experience so far. And this kind of central structure in the middle is also inspired from forms in the painting, but it's meant to be a kind of abstract tree. But it's divided into five zones where people can do different activities from um, growing produce to cooking to, to playing to having a conversation or maybe even just finding some time to sit by yourself and contemplate in the city which was one thing that we realized we don't have enough a space to do um, like just to be alone and to be quiet with our own thoughts but um, the idea behind this was to look at a kind of piece of infrastructure that could go into some of these green spaces that could enable people to stay in them for longer and encourage more diverse forms of activity and throughout the pavilion we worked with our graphic designers Kellen Berger White to um work on signage that would actually encourage people to do things because a lot of the signage in privatized public space is really about telling you what not to do and um, also how to encourage this sense of like collective agency so even the font looks like a kind of finger painted font which is really was something really fun and they also worked on this incredible gradient that you can see on the walls um, that is actually sampled from pigment a pigment analysis of the Bosch painting so all these little details kind of come together but they're really meant to make you question like how you can take these tools and apply them to privatize public spaces in your own um, city or space and um, what we really wanted was like not to tell people how to behave in privatized public space but actually learn from how they interacted with these large-scale exhibits um i suppose sorry just to say you can see the the tech the text that manager's talking about on these three signs here saying like loiter welcome um play music and then uh, maybe maddie if you want to go to the next yeah um and so yeah also just say like uh, in each of the rooms as well there are these sort of sound installations because we really wanted to create a sort of experience for all the senses so in the little alcoves as well you can hear these different people talking about their experience of green spaces in our cities um, yeah, and people from different generations as well yeah um but yeah i guess this so this is the plan of the whole pavilion um and the idea is that it's all stitched together by this kind of continuous garden path that takes you from all of these different um privatized public space spaces from one to the next and um and then there's also a kind of surprise seventh room that um is like maybe outside of the pavilion or like not an unexpected room that's been opened up for the first time yeah so this is the toilets uh, which is really looking at the importance of public Public toilets and allowing us access to public space. So it's all well and good having like a really nice landscape park, but unless you have the infrastructure that allows people to actually use it on their own terms, so like public toilets, free seating, uh, water fountains, drinking fountains, we're really interested in all those little bits of infrastructure that actually allow people to use public space. And we're super interested when we came over, uh, it was in 2019 now, uh, to see the pavilion. Um, they were installing the Art Biennale and the British Pavilion is one of the few pavilions that actually has toilets in its basement. And it was this huge social hub. It was just full of people uh, coming to use the toilets. And as a result, the install team got to know all the other pavilions really well. And we're like, this is actually really important kind of well, it's not only an important facility, but it's also allowing this kind of social conversations. We suddenly realised we actually met in the queues for the toilets at the AA. Um, and so, you know, we really wanted to actually open up this toilet to allow the public to use it. And we were hit with so many difficulties. So the first one was that the British Council were too embarrassed of the state of the toilets um, and eventually got over that hurdle. Um, but uh, La Biennale sort of said, you know, actually you can't open up these toilets. They're not fully accessible. They don't meet our Italian building regulations. Um, and so at that point, we realised we wouldn't be able to open them up. But what we could do was put them on display, which almost makes the point even better that, you know, we've got all these facilities like lying around in our cities that people aren't able to access. Um, and, you know, how do we actually deal with that red tape and how do we have these conversations about to how we actually logistically um, and physically can open up these pieces of, of public space that sh should be able to be used by anyone? 
Um, and so that sort of concludes our, our tour of the Garden of Privatised Delights. Um, and I think overall, we sort of really want to invite everyone to ask the question, why can't all public spaces be gardens of delight? Um, and we really invite you all to be part of this conversation and debate. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to the conversation now with uh, Suda and Alex. Thank yeah, you. Sorry, that was so long. <laughs> Hopefully there's still time for us to have a big discussion. Super nice, though. Thank you. So nice yeah. to hear. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I was just looking already. We have a we have a question. Um, well, thank you very much. I think it's uh, it's just uh, it's it's a very um, there are a lot of like very interesting overlapping and commonalities. I think between the two pavilions, but there are also somehow some kind of diversities and like different aspects, both in the way you probably dealt uh, with, the, with the topic, which I thought, and also you dealt with the exhibition itself as a response to the topic, which of course, as we said, mentioned before, is something that is sometimes is also dictated by the space. So this idea of narrative, of course, in the space and in the research that Madeleine and Manager you did, of course, was also like, um, was kind of enhanced also by the by the the, the way the British Pavilion is somehow um, the, the architecture of the pavilion itself and somehow allows this sort of narrative and of course in 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 your case I think instead Suter and Alex that narrative is a bit in, is more implicit and in this sort of like object that enclose both this narration and, and narration and the kind of density also of the research I think that in both cases there is something that I really admire both pavilion, which I think it's so rare about the Biennale in general, but it's also something that I think also in this Biennale particularly is very, is very common and is somehow a lot of curators and a lot of um, invitees, let's say, brought into, into, into the, on, onto the table. And it's this one-to-one -one structure, right? Like, so this idea of using the, the exhibition as a sort of experiential space or so transforming the research as something that we can all experience and we don't have to necessarily just read as audience, but as really as active participant. And I think that in both both pavilion, this is so strong, and I think it's it's something that is really um, is extremely valuable because it really turns a research that is so difficult. Because as you you both somehow tackle a topic that is it's very delicate, like right? it's almost this. It tries really to go beyond this dichotomy of applied public and private. We can't think about the collective space or the coming together as something that really happens within the dichotomy of either a private or a public space but it really like tries to question how can we come together really in, and what are the different ways of coming together and this idea of like unveiling architecture as a process I think is extremely important but it's also very hard to 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 present because it could be a very tedious argument and of course also very complex to to grasp but I think in both cases there is this immediacy of like translating, like using architecture as a kind of tool of translation of a topic into something that is three-dimensional and one-to-one -one really, and the audience can go through it and really like participate, actively participate in it. Um, I have a first question on, on this actually, um, which is um, what do you think, where do you think the architect sits in this? Like in, I, I, I mentioned this as a sort of act of translation that we do as architects. And I think that is also something extremely beautiful in the, in, in the process of your, or both your, your research, which is this sort of conversation with the public, which is very clear, for instance, in that kind of collage that um, you, of the Ministry of Common Land in your case, but also in all the process uh, of the kind of relationship with the public and the different kind of means and tools in the Philippine Pavilion, like how the model becomes really like the kind of common ground on which we can really work and democratically and all come together and we understand the different tools. But where do we sit as architect? How are we just coordinator of this? Do we have an active, um, where does our agency, let's say, lies? Which I think is always complicated when we discuss about this sort of mediations. 
I mean, maybe I can just, I can start and then others can pick up. But I think for, from our perspective, we really saw the architect as the kind of communicator. And so um, the ability to kind of communicate with like in, in traditional practice, like, you know, to communicate with all the different people involved in a project, but specifically around privatized public space, like we found um, through doing this project, we got to have really interesting conversations with both the private sector from developers and landowners to the public sector with policymakers, and then also with just like users of, of privatized public space and what they might want to see differently. And we found that a lot of people really were interested in the same things, but they were having these conversations in silos. And there was like a really important like kind of role of the architect as a translator to kind of bring people together. But also, I think it's really important that we all kind of value the expertise architects can bring. Like, so how do you translate conversations and ideas into spaces? And and think about how spaces serve different people at different times of day or for different purposes. And um, like, I guess, how do you actually like listen to people actively and translate that into space was something that was really important. And that's something that all we always saw the pavilion as a kind of platform to bring together other people that were working in these ways. And so all the different practices that we were able to work with um, each have their own tools, whether it's a situated image or, um, you know, whether it's how Studio Polpo was really like actively testing things out on the high street. Like each of them have been testing these things in their practice for many years. And we wanted them to kind of somehow embody that in what they installed in the pavilion. Yeah, I, I think as well, just to say that I think architecture is inherently political and often architects sort of step away from that. And I think that was something we really wanted to embrace was how we as architects actually can create, take more of a political stance um, and use our skills in ways beyond just physical building. There's sort of this public perception of what an architect does. And then there's what we all think architects can do. And we sort of all realize that, you know, we have this incredible education. We have all these amazing skills. And then suddenly you go into practice and you're kind of channeled into one route. And I think we were really interested in challenging that and looking at how we can take those skills. Um, you know, architects are incredible communicators, as manager says you know the way that we can like bring people around a table through a sketch um and you know sort of understand where different people are coming from and that role that we can take in bringing people together to really have these conversations over something that can be quite polarized was really important to us and then in the way that we physically manifested the exhibition as well it was really important to us that this was an exhibition that anyone could come in and understand and anyone could come in and use and so we really wanted to get rid of any kind of jargon we don't have much text at all in the exhibition there's just one question on each of the walls um, and that was really important to us because it means that people can just come in and experience this space and start to use it in different ways we never would have imagined um, and yeah I suppose that widening access to the pavilion and having a debate that's not just within architecture circles it's not just architecture for architects but it's architecture for everyone was really really important to us Yeah, in our case, I, I agree, you know, like the architects are also, you know, excellent, but the, our job is to communicate definitely. And at the same time, I think, you know, a lot of it also has to do with making connections somehow, making the connections between like, let's say institutions and the communities that we are working with. And so in, in a sense, we are able to find somehow the, the potential and match it with the need somehow. Um, in the particular case of the Biennale, we, we know that the Philippine Pavilion always, uh, that our commissioners always hold an open call for these things. And Alex and I saw that as, in a sense, an opportunity to create a project with a community. So, you know, that knowledge of knowing that there is such a thing as the Biennale, which has a grant for like uh, building something or creating a sub something as a participation for Venice, we saw that as an opportunity to make a connection between that institution and the community that we're working with. So, in a sense, yes, uh, that's definitely one, one role that we see there. But an another also, I see ourselves as. In, in the work that Alex and I are doing. I think we see ourselves also as participants in this a platform of a, through like a sharing of knowledge, through creating a mutual exchange of this knowledge. I think Alex and I are there as participants with a particular set of knowledge that we can share with the community. And the community also has a knowledge that they can share with us. So we see that as the way that we can exchange knowledge together. And, and it's so nice to see uh, your presentation of the pavilion because we've been there and we've gone through the spaces but it's also so nice to hear what you emphasize when you talk about these rooms because there's so much we have in common like the way you talk about architecture as a language 
uh, as a way to translate and communicate ideas um, in a way that is political. Uh, you know, citizen assemblies is a form of deliberative democracy, which is trying to make people part of the deliberation of the policies that shapes our society. And they do that through citizens' assemblies, right? The premise there is that people have access to the same information uh, as everyone in that group, and then deliberate on what is right or wrong, and you bring people in from different perspectives. Now, as architects, what we can add to that process, and we're talking a little bit with Nicole Carato, uh, deliberative democracy also in our pavilion, uh, is kind of by the, through our tools as architect, you know, through drawings, through models, through uh, full-scale structures, we can communicate other forms of relations that are political, that are social, that are, you know, private or public, or, you know, so it's also nice to see these installations in your space because they're also doing that as kind of a, as a mock-up or a prototype or, you know, which is also kind of like what we're trying to do when we work with our communities is to question or to use the tools of an architect to question the situation that we're in. And, I, you know, this full-scale structure is also a really, really a good way to, to put the finger on uh, some issues and, you know, share that kind of knowledge that Sudar is talking about. So, so that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I think the community aspect's really important and really interesting because no one knows a place like the local community. Um, and I think that's often where projects have gone wrong when there's just been sweeping kind of statements made that, you know, then results in some completely like uncontextual building. And I think something that we almost struggled with a bit in the project was um, that, you know, we're not trying to say there's one solution for each of these issues. Everything needs to be quite locally specific. So it's like, how do you actually um, sort of come up with a methodology for people to adopt um, in different communities? So that how do you have that kind of line of flexibility so things are flexible enough for a community to be able to take ownership and do something? But, you know, how do you as an architect also bring your skills to that situation? So I think it's really interesting and kind of like an important uh, kind of statement as well, that we are also just participants when, when yeah, we're part of this as well from, from both kind of uh, levels. But it's nice, I'm sorry, I'm, but this idea of the triptych is nice also because it brings out the, the contrasts, you know, uh, so that actually the discourse is actually addressing some some dilemmas you know what what do we bring into the common uh of the good and the bad you know like it's it's that negotiation which again is that idea of deliberation right you know how do we negotiate the space that we want to have in our society so that yeah i think that is also something quite interesting about you as what you were saying madeleine and then this Sometimes the architect, I also was thinking while you were all talking that um, it's there really just to also bring a bit of awareness. The, the things are there, the communities are there and they're so rich and they're already like actively trying to engage. So what, what our role, our possible role is also this sort of like as a sort of not just a translator, but as a person that really makes you aware of the power that you can have. As a, as, a, as a community itself of that sort of, and I think also in, in all the four of you, I think in, in the practices also beyond the pavilion and your, let's say, idea of architectures, it's really like also engaging with this, with this opportunity that the architect has, as, and I think it's extremely important, which I think also might bring us to uh, some of the questions because there are some questions. So the first one is from Paolo, uh, so there is one question for Suder and Alex, which is, I wanted to ask how you think, feel this collaborative process with the communities that design and build with you has evolved since Street Light at Puro, or even further back than that. That's for you. And then there is one for Mani Jen Madeleine. Do you want to go for that, Suder? Yeah, you, go, you can start, Alex. I'll, I'll... Because the question relates to what Sura and I have been doing is we've been working with this platform of mutual support for 12 years, uh, almost. We did this first by building and working in the Philippines before one of those big super typhoons happened. Now, what happens in the immediate aftermath was that people had to build back. The whole city was destroyed. 7,000 people lost their lives. Uh, it was a very, very... Um, actually, we were having an exhibition at the AA exactly when that happened. So, so that... <laughs> So then, you know, we moved back to the Philippines and we started the process of building back with the community through mutual support. Now, the question is how our process have developed since then. Uh, 
understanding the importance of working through mutual support in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, you know, that was the experience of working in Tacloban. It goes beyond just the immediate, uh, in the immediate aftermath. I think it's something that needs to be discussed even before something happens, you know, and actually we have experienced the COVID situation. We have experienced, um, Sudan and I have also been in a situation where there's been floods, uh, other kind of disasters and working through these traditions before something happens can be very important to be able to then create, um, structures or architecture that responds to issues before they happen. And I think it's important. Uh, so that's the Philippine pavilion now is really also addressing this. I mean, we got the pandemic happening in the middle of it, but, but how do we work together and how can we help each other get through, uh, life and whatever is thrown at us, you know, somehow. So do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, no, on the more practical sense, I think, you know, like at the start of the process, Alex and I were just like roughly aware of this uh, framework that exists through mutual support. You know, there, there are already existing methods of work that that are in place that we are trying to learn from. And at the start, of course, it's a like a blurry idea of, of how it can be done. But throughout the years, I think with the process that we've been trying to develop, it's gotten more and more refined. And we've had some time to reflect and improve upon the processes that we work with. So over time, we've been able to make it more specific, make it more uh, at least uh, more efficient, in the, at least in the amount of time that we spend uh, with the communities in, in learning how to structure this process better through these six-step processes. So at first, it was like just everything. And then now, through the six-step process, I think we're able to refine it quite a bit. I mean, also it deals with the question of like when something happens, you know, what this idea of private and public space also collapses, right? There's nothing left. The typhoon has taken everything. And so it's interesting to work. Uh, this is something that in the immediate aftermath of the typhoon, this discussion of what is private and public was something that people remembered. <laughs> you know, the idea of this boundary was, you know, the, the typhoon had took, taken away the wall, but there was the memory of that boundary. So actually, you could say that our society is very much in the way that we narrate to tell the story of our society uh, and the way that people remember it or not. Because in the immediate aftermath, there was nothing left. So but the walls were still there, you know, <laughs> in people's minds. You know, I think that's interesting. But sorry, uh, Madia Manager, there's a question for you too. Paolo, do you do you want to go to do you want me to read the question? Is that okay? Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so for Manny J. Madeleine, um, I'm curious, has there been political interest from Parliament regarding the ideas around collective ownership or action that you've discussed in the pavilion? That's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really great question because, um, I mean, actually from the outset, we started trying to talk to politicians um, about this subject. And we met with Sean Berry from the Green Party quite early on. Um, and she's been doing loads of work around privatised public space um, and how to ensure sort of that public space, anything that's a sort of considered a public space has the same kind of regulations around it. Because at the moment, it's really scary when you're walking around the city, you have no idea who owns that bit of land you're on until you break the rules. And so how do you have this kind of common set of standards and rules for, for all public spaces? So that really came out, for example, in 2011, when they had the Occupy London protests uh, just near St. Paul's on Paternoster Square. And it felt, I mean, it, Paternoster Square feels like a public square and loads of people were protesting there. And then it turned out it was privately owned by the Mitsubishi Estate Company and everyone got thrown off and told they weren't allowed to protest there. And it's suddenly really scary when you realise that what you're considering public spaces are privately owned and you have no idea what you're allowed to do there. And so... Um, actually, um, last year, the GLA launched their draft public L London charter, and they've just uh, launched the final one this year. Um, and that sort of sets out this series of rules and regulations that all privatised public spaces have to obey now. And so there's, I think, a series of sort of 12 or 13 rules. Um, and they're things like every privatised public space has to be free to all, has to be like publicly welcoming um, and things like that. And uh, we've been really fortunate to be a part of some of those discussions as well that have informed it, which have been really exciting. Um, and I think over the past year as well, um, you know, we've been lucky enough to be invited to quite a few discussions with the GLA's Good Growth uh, by Recovery team. 
Um, and it's been really exciting to see how a sector which has traditionally been quite risk averse is suddenly trying and testing out new things. Um, and so, for example, this kind of rollout of all the cycle lanes very quickly um, after COVID hit and the lockdowns um, and the ways that they're allowing people to sort of take over their streets and sort of encouraging play streets and things like this has been really exciting uh, to sort of see. Um, actually, I don't know if you want to add to that because you're obviously part of those discussions as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I guess for anyone who doesn't know, the GLA is the mayor's office in London, and this stands for the Greater London Authority. But um, it's it's been really exciting, actually, that through getting the, the commission to design the pavilion, that we've been able to be part of those conversations. And actually, it was like a kind of perfect timing kind of overlap, because um, we weren't. We we didn't, actually didn't know that the that the GLA was planning to launch the draft public London charter, and then it ended up being perfect because they were trying to learn from the research we were doing for the pavilion, and we were trying to learn from all the many discussions they were having with kind of stakeholders across the whole city um, uh, about like what were the types of of, of privatized public spaces that exist and how much were our rights from public space being compromised in privatized public space, and so it's like the first attempt to kind of really try and govern these spaces and um it's been the conversations have been really incredible and they they've done like really specific roundtables around covid and the impact of covid on a public space um that that's where like with that conversation about how they need to like think fast act fast fail fast okay, came about but then there's also been one specifically on the high street and some of these typologies under threat and like, what are ways we can reinvigorate the high street? What are ideas that different local authorities and community groups have for um, like, there was one about like kind of teenage markets and like making teenagers more entrepreneurial to like set up a market for them one day a week. And one borough was doing it. And then there was like a workshop where all these other boroughs wanted to learn more from them so that they could do copy that same model. So in terms of like networks of mutual support, it's really interesting how that's actually coming from the government, but it's been, I think it shows also like the agency behind the kind of getting commissioned to do a national pavilion. Like we probably wouldn't have been able to be part of these conversations um, had we not like gotten the platform of the pavilion. And so it's been actually a, a useful way to kind of get these tools and conversations out there and then allow that to kind of feed into a kind of bigger, more long-term process or conversation. I think that, the question. that answer actually manages also types to the next question about, that Lawrence is asking uh, about this access, uh, like the access of to the debate, of course, this sort of like allowing everyone to also participate to the debate, but also he's asking actually, um, my, uh, it's about the interpreting access. Actually, this is a question for both pavilion. So access to privatized public space, access to construction knowledge, access to the service of design professional, access to what space is not known as private or public. I think it's a very interesting question and it continues. Do you all think the prevailing modes of architectural practice and its approach to make a difference spatially is still inaccessible to all? I think that's a great question and like something that we really encountered. There's so much jargon in architectural practice and the way architects talk to other architects about, um, about the city or about spaces and about construction. And I think um, both exhibitions really try and, and stop doing that. And I think that's what we really loved about the Philippines Pavilion as well, is that like it was really like involving the community. And I think Sudhar, you said earlier about, you know, you guys brought some expertise, but the community also has expertise. And how do we allow that knowledge to be exchanged? And for us, like we, I mean, whenever we've gone to the Biennale in the past, you have this fatigue of like just reading like what's like a book exhibited on walls of a, of a pavilion. And we wanted people, people don't experience architecture that way. And like non-architects don't really understand models and drawings unless they're really initiated into that process. So we really wanted to like create this one-to-one -one experience so that people could really experience and explore um, these spaces and, and actually understand enough about what they were like as they exist, like, so what is a pub in the UK like for an international audience, but then also what were we proposing to do differently? And as Maddie explained with the example with Patnos to Square, like 
what looks like a public space sometimes isn't public, but like there's no distinction in the public's mind when they see a space. Um, they don't think immediately like who owns that space. And that's the kind of the problem really, because anything that looks like a public space, you should be able to like kind of operate in the same way within it. And it's it's weird that these privatized public spaces have their own rules. And um, there's so many things that you're restricted from doing there. And like, so this, the draft public London charter is like the first attempt to kind of I guess equal the playing field, but it's uh, our hope is that that gets adopted on a much wider scale. And we actually asked um, the team working on the charter to contribute to our catalog as a way to kind of try and disseminate that further. So I think it's a really important th question about like how do these these terms or these ways of looking at space like how do we actually initiate the public to be part of that conversation and give them tools so that they actually understand what we're talking about? Yeah. Um... Hi, Lawrence. It's great to hear from you after so many years. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a really, really great question. And um, as Manager is saying, I think, yeah, access to the conversation is sort of at the heart and the root, I guess, of, of both pavilions, which is why we love the Philippines Pavilion so much as well. Um, but from the beginning, we we're also trying to think about how we were talking about not just the pavilion, but like the catalogue, for example, the catalogue became a really good opportunity for us to create a manual. And it's, it's almost like we envisaged it as a manual to give people to allow them to then take ownership over their public spaces. Um, and as Francesca was saying earlier, like as a citizen, you have so much power um, over what is going on around you, but often you don't realise that because why would you? Like, it's just such a difficult um, kind of way that the world has been set up. Um, I mean, I'm most familiar with UK regulations and stuff, but it's all just, it's so hard for people to understand how to become a part of the planning process and the power that you have within that. Um, and I think we really saw our role as almost breaking down a lot of these uh, conversations and I suppose finding the cracks within within the kind of regulations and frameworks that we can then start to um, sort of gain power and, and unravel. Um, and I think then in terms of practice, I think through our practice, I guess we're kind of figuring out and trying to discover how it is that we can give communities uh, greater ownership over their public spaces and, and start to um, understand how we can sort of challenge traditional architecture practice, which seems to just sort of answer questions, but also ask the questions ourselves um, and through that start to um, I suppose challenge through not not practicing traditionally. I suppose start to challenge how we can take on a different role as architects to sort of empower communities. Yeah, in our case as well. I think it, um, obviously there is a barrier, sort of uh, in terms of how architecture is practiced today. And I think though that it's it's a barrier that of course you know, people with expertise they study years and years and years to get to the point where they could have a conversation about the basics of architecture even. But but I think, you know, Alex and I, what we're trying to do is really create the tool set, like Manage and Maddie were saying, like a tool, a set of tools or set of methods, which kind of uh, simplify the way the, the language that we use, the language, but at the same time, the modes of communication that we use to be able to communicate what architecture is or what it is about, communicate sort of like architectural ideas to a community in the language that they, they can understand. So in a sense, that's why we use these different forms of communication that go beyond language somehow. So sometimes we, the, the models allow us to go beyond language, you know, acting, you know, physically playing out space, uh, uh, activities in a space allows us to go beyond the constraints of that language. And somehow even in the communities that we work with, where there is like, uh, that we were practicing in Vietnam as well, the community that we're working with there uh, speaks in a language called Hmong, which is uh, their their local language, and it's uh, totally different from the partners that we're working with who speak Vietnamese. So um, there's like two layers of language barriers that we need to get across. But I think through you know fit making something physical, building things with your hands, and acting things out, I think we were able to go beyond those constraints and talk about the the roots of what architecture means to them as well. It's quite interesting. I always find the physical act of making things together, like it brings people together in a way like no other. And you get all different generations coming together, which wouldn't otherwise normally happen. And then the conversations that you have with people are just so different than if it was like a traditional consultation event or something. Um, and there is something amazing about that physical act of making. 
Also just like acting. I think that was like amazing. The example that you showed of like the of the community kind of talking about the typhoon, but really like acting out its impact or like personifying it, which I think is like a, a tool that's completely untapped in, in the context of the UK and more people should be using. But also it was very interesting, I think, also what you were when you were saying, Alex, about how people respond to different tools. So people are more from, more like participate more like in the production on the, of the model, but instead other are more keen on talking and participating orally in the conversation. I think the diversity of a co- within of the individuals within a community also kind of bring to challenge the means of discussion uh, that the architect need to kind of be aware of and ha- how to balance those means according to each different community, which I think is also something that really and this idea of looking at architecture not as a mere outcome of a process, but as a process itself, I think is something that you both have very strongly in common. And is also something that it's the reason why also I'm extremely glad that we are having this conversation within an academic environment, because it's a way to kind of also challenge the status quo of the architect itself, as you were saying also before, like Madeleine, I think it, when when we go out with all this luggage of information, we go out and we just act a bit like in a sort of automatic world, right? Like there are a specific rules of production that we need to respond to. Whereas of course, the sort of freedom of like um, the margin of, of experimentation that we have within academia are very similar to the one that you have also in, in the research that you then present at the Biennale. So I think that there is like, they really unveil the different and the potential that the architect as a as a citizen has also in in uh, in constructing possible worlds and i think it's very relevant to have this conversation i think within within academia and really like try to bridge the two because i think is extremely important um which i think also is is the comment that was made by Jorge, which I think, I don't know if you if he left, but that is, um, I'm gonna read it because I think it's very, it's very important. It's just a comment, it's not a question, but uh, he has to leave earlier. So um, both cases make me think about assets um, like water or even knowledge that should be public and how it has the potential of being or not implicit in space. So I think there is social responsibility in your work telling us how every space containing water somehow gets to be free. Same thing happens with knowledge. We can see how the Philippine Pavilion is made up of public knowledge and also serving as a play to work with knowledge. I think it's a very beautiful way of putting it, right? Like, so this idea of, and which also somehow connects to what the Lawrence point, now this idea of access, access to knowledge, but also on knowledge as, as an asset, right? Like everything that brings us together is an asset that we need to have access to. So I think it's a very uh, beautiful way of putting the two things together. Um, Is there any other questions from the public? Maybe between the two of you. (laughs) I maybe to pick up on that point of like um, knowledge, but also these assets, like I think that's also what we were trying to uncover with the public toilet, that... Mm. It's like a taboo subject, but also we often think of like these public spaces that we come together. And while the toilet is a private space, it's like that kind of access to that kind of, I don't know, civic infrastructure or these important spaces that actually like that provide if without the provision of public toilets, it's a huge barrier as to who can access public space or how long you can stay away from your home. And um, it like that water fountain, so many of the things that, you know, are what we would say are the kind of basic needs in order to inhabit public space for a long period of time, um, this need to be provided. And like, so, you know, if, if there's not funding from like the public sector to provide these like public private partnerships are one option or like the private sector, like, you know, this, all of these things enable them to meet some of their goals as well. And so those are the types of conversations we wanted to have, but also, just to get people to talk about these things that they're not talking about at the moment. And I suppose as well, how everything is acting as a network. And I think that's what our whole pavilion is really looking at the networks of these different spaces and how they all do work together. And you can't just look at one item 
isolated scenario and how, you know, whenever we as architects get a project, you know, we have to look outside of the red line boundary and understand how what we're doing is acting as part of a wider network and how it's contributing to a wider kind of city. And I suppose, again, it goes back to that thing of the different scales, you know, everything is everything we're doing as architects is acting at multiple scales. And I think that's something that really comes out in the Philippines Pavilion as well, because I mean, I thought it was an absolutely beautiful piece of architecture as well when I was there. Like, it's absolutely stunning, the kind of craftsmanship and everything. But at the same time, how it's acting at that wider scale within the community is just incredible. I mean, I think you also talked about earlier, you said this thing of like architects kind of responding to a question rather than actually being part of asking. And I, I think that in general is really, really important when we talk about assets, knowledge, access, it's like who asks this question, who asks the question that we're responding to <laughs> and how can we actually create platforms to let people be part of asking the question that needs to be dealt with? Because we have so many issues and challenges that there, there are many ways of addressing. Uh, but unless we ask also our involved people in the process of asking that question, they don't have access to actually other than being passive kind of consumers of the result of it. So I think that's an important, really important point. Uh, you know in in terms of all of this but also for us i mean the 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 physical output in itself is a result of asking the question together i think so then you know in a way the architectural result is not really something that sura and i could have done without the community it's something that becomes a very kind of blurred uh, relationship you know where we are tapping into many different layers of the society and kind of within that kind of crystallizing some areas which became you know library which dealt with education and conflict, which deals with the density of the place. But at the same time, there's so many other kind of non-addressed aspects, which is part of getting to that point, which I think is why we need to look at things like, you know, citizen assemblies or, you know, what are the political spaces where people are part of defining the question and the language of how we define that question or, or talk or discuss that question. Uh, you know, these things are so it's it's really nice with the pavilion the, the the work that you have because it really does address different layers also of society. I think it's interesting. Uh, you know, Sudar, we also talk about Tambayan, right? Which I, you know, they're talking about the playground where people can linger and hang around, which in you know, in 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 our community was one of the first things that the kids were addressing is this Tambayan, a place to linger or hang out, you know. Uh, you know, so there's there's all these layers of programming that is put onto this thing that you make together that isn't also necessarily articulated. Uh, so there's a lot there. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I I love the idea. I mean, I think like uh, any maybe architect coming into this like just to design a building probably wouldn't think about a library and a space for conflict or for yeah. discussion <laughs> to like be in the same to be in the same architectural project. And I love that like from the discussions and process with the community, those ended up being in the same space. And it makes perfect sense when you described it. So it's um I think that's maybe part of the problem that we're we we are too restrictive about what these spaces can be. And that like you know a playground can also be a space to like hang out. It can be a space to dance and perform, but it can be so many other things. And that we don't need to just label these spaces as being one thing and it needs to be really specific to the needs of the people that are going to use it. Mm. I guess we all come with our own baggage to the project as well, don't we? So it's very hard to think outside of ways that you've, you've previously thought. And that's the amazing thing about then collaborating with all these other people from other kind of backgrounds. Yeah. It starts to really challenge you and challenge those preconceptions that you bring. I think that also this brings us to like maybe the my my original question about the the sort of role of the architect because again also another role is really this 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 sort of uh, sort of let's call it duty maybe but like to of reveal alternative usage of a space right like a space that is can be actually so banal and is is an is an asset that we consider so ordinary and that is there and should be actually used by everyone, but there are so many different ways according to the audience that is actually interacts with that space, that occupy that space, that really can show us different ways of occupying the space as possible projects of architecture, let's say, and the city at large. I think that the example of St. Paul, of St. Paul and Paternoster Square is very interesting because who would have ever thought that a sacred space actually would have been a space for protest, right? Like in, and in that case, it's very, it's very interesting how 
it's just like a movement of people that just they are unveiling a different way of occupying a space, which is not just a space of liturgy, but in that case would it would have been a space for like uh, like opening tents, you know, and sleeping for like twenty days. So I think that that's again like probably is an, a different way of of being an architect, like in the contemporary scene in the contemporary city, right? Like as also again probably as this mediator as a person that really like ask the questions, maybe sometimes that could be the right question to then challenge the status quo of space, um, which I think in both cases uh, of the pavilions, in both pavilions, I think that's extremely strong and I really recommend every one of you who can <laughs> travel to Venice really like go because it's uh, it's it's a very beautiful experience. Uh, as I said, like is a is an experiential um, visit. It's not just like something that you read it's something that you read you can't necessarily grasp it from from the catalog of the biennale it's really something that you have to go there and see um i don't know if oh we have sorry one last question probably by eugene um Quite ironic to have such beautiful projects, an idea that's supposed to bring people, communities together, and yet hit with an invisible force that is pulling us apart, political pandemic. What do you think are we losing if public physical connection is being redefined? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who wants to venture here? Is it a moment to talk about CC or? Yeah, I think so. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah. The, sil the silver lining. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go for it, you guys. Uh, you should go okay for it, Sita. Yeah. yeah so I, I mean, it, it's right. I think a lot of the work that we have been pra practicing requires kind of the physical presence. So everything's, you know, very physical. A lot of it has to do with being in the space, being present. So obviously, a lot of that has had to change uh, over the course of the years. But uh, what's interesting is that now, you know, maybe because of this pandemic, I think because of the conditions where we find ourselves in, like now on Zoom. What we find is that while we can't be physically present with with the communities that we work with, we are finding that there is you know maybe larger communities that we can make which span across borders and across you know physical space. So we are going beyond kind of the limits of the physical space where we have and still trying to make the same or similar connections. Um, one example is like uh, what we're mentioning is the curators collective uh, idea that uh, you know since we had one more year to to kind of work on the pavilions. The curators uh, started out with a few emails and we got together and set a series of meetings and we kind of just were there and created a space for us to all communicate and talk to each other and just create a space to, to kind of share our experience of what we were all going through at the same time. There was a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of, you know, uh, unknowns in terms of the budgets. You know, when is this biennale going to happen? So somehow we found a common uh you know, cause somehow to to come together. And then when we just came together, we didn't really know what's going to come out of it, but we figured having that space and creating this uh, ch channel of communication uh, will allow us to create something together somehow. And uh, we kept meeting for over the year and maybe about once or twice a month, uh, approximately. And uh, we, uh, as a result of this, there were some projects that were initiated as part of the CC that, uh, that created like benches in, in Venice as then a student competition. Other one was like, there was an exchange of materials between different pavilions. And of course, making the connections like, like this, this, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this talk, you know, started through the AA, but of course, you know, other connections through different lectures and different creators. We, we kind of saw thematically how we were aligned and tried to capitalize on that and sort of create something together. Mm. Yeah, I think because I think uh, I think normally like everyone's quite sort of siloed, and it's such an intense project. You kind of it's quite hard to meet other people as well outside of your kind of individual project. And it's been incredible to see the kind of themes and how we are really aligned in a lot of the topics we're exploring, and have those kind of real international dialogues. And I think those are so important right now as well. And it has been this really weird silver lining of seeing how Zoom has actually just facilitated this. And, you know, we've had fascinating discussions with you guys, with like the Peruvian pavilion, exploring very similar topic to us. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just been incredible. And I think the CC has been this real silver lining. And I think, you know, we've all had to re 
rethink how we're communicating what it is we're exploring. Um, and this weird kind of hybrid world, I think, has weirdly made a lot of things much more accessible. You know, we've managed to have like a 3D kind of tour scan scan done of our pavilion that you can go on now um, online, for example. And that means like anyone can now go visit the pavilion, whether they're in Venice or not. Um, and, you know, all these online discussions we've uh, been able to have as well. Um, so, yeah, I think obviously we're all kind of figuring out um, this kind of weird hybrid world at the moment, but it does feel really exciting in terms of the topics we're exploring, how we kind of explore things both physically and digitally. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a nice way to end the, the discussion because the Curators Collective is like the a kind of meta narrative about mutual support or how we've managed to get through the last two years. Um, I think like, although the pandemic has maybe forced us to, to be physically separate, it's in, in, it made us reinvent so many ways to come together. And it's definitely made a lot of these topics feel even more urgent rather than maybe distract from it. So I think the need for like community participation, like you guys have been exploring in the Philippines or like the, the importance of public space to be accessible to everyone was really highlighted during the lockdowns last year. So it feels like there's a real urgency post pandemic or as we come out of the pandemic behind these topics. But I think just personally, like the initiatives like the Curators Collective, like have made all of us like just feel like there's, a change in architecture as well that can that as a profession we can be more collaborative and less kind of individually driven and that's kind of a great network of mutual support that we hope continues beyond this biennale that's a good note <laughs> to, to <laughs> end up probably um thank you very much everyone for um for participating in this discussion i think it was very interesting and probably we could have ended up going on for very long. I think we can continue, uh, hopefully this, we can continue on a similar line in the next um, events. So the next one is on the 8th of November. Am I right, manager, right? Yeah, we have a break next week because it's because our it's open, open week, week at the AS. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we're gonna, we're gonna see each other again on the 8th of November yeah. and there we kind of work, uh, we will see the, the kind of other side from the summer school and how the summer school actually at the AA has tried to bridge with the, with the Biennale this year and hopefully for the years to come. And, and uh, Francesca so, and I'll be flipping positions, so she'll yeah, be exactly. and I'll be moderating. <laughs> Yes, exactly. But it's it's very it's on it's a kind of a nice continuation of this topic because it's on yeah. spatial contracts, so coming out of a conversation of mutual support, like yeah, and I think especially in the last comment, probably and how this sort of physical and digital can work together. They're not necessarily a dichotomy, right? But they can really like cooperate, and I think that's what we try to do, probably also with the summer school. Okay, thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you so much, uh, thank, thank you, Alex, so thank much, you, thank Madeleine, you. and manager. Alex. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you everyone, for coming and all the amazing questions. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. The Biennale is open until the 21st of November. <laughs> if good. you can go, please do. <laughs> You'll be there for the closing. So if anyone's yeah. coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See ya. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.